Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Garrigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional owners of the land we're gathered on this evening, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Welcome to the launch of issue 41.3 of the University of New South Wales Law Journal, um, our only thematic issue for the year, entitled Vulnerability and the Law. It's wonderful to see so many here, and wonderful too to be here at King and Wood Mallison's. Uh, the launch at KWM is always a highlight on the journal's calendar, due of course to the wonderful space, even better outlook, uh, and the very warm welcome which we receive here, but also because of the excitement of having published another issue of the journal after a long year of hard work uh, to do so. I want to welcome our special guest this evening, uh, Emeritus Professor Rosalind Croucher, the President of the Australian Human Rights Commission, and Ms Rosemary Kays, Human Rights Lawyer, Interim Director of the Disability Innovation Institute at UNSW, as well as a lecturer at UNSW Law, Chairperson of the Australian Centre for Law and Disability, uh, and as of her election in June of this year, a member of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability. In addition, we're joined by... <laughs> That was the shortest I could make the introduction as well. <laughs> In addition, we're joined by Scott Farrell, a partner here at Kingwood Mallison's and an ambassador for the firm's community impact team. Uh, and with Scott is Jane Timms, who is a, a pro bono and community programs advisor, administrator here at KWM. And finally, we're joined by Professor Andrew Lynch, uh, the head of school at UNSW Law. I extend a warm welcome and hearty thanks to you all for being with us. A special thank you must go to our premier sponsor and host this evening, King and Wood Mallisons. It is no exaggeration to say that the journal would not have evolved to be the publication it is today without the support of King and Wood Mallisons. Having been a sponsor of the journal for some 37 years now, the firm has been a vital supporter of generations of student editors who have gone on to success in diverse careers in the law and elsewhere. The success of the journal's transition to its new publication structure, the launch this year of its new e-publication, the UNSW Law Journal Forum, uh, and the high and ever improving caliber of the scholarship which we publish is thanks in no small part to the support of King and Wood Mallisons. On behalf of the editors, editors of the journal, our authors, uh, contributors and reviewers, I thank King and Wood Mallisons, uh, and in particular, Ms. Kelly Mildred and Ms. Grace Mackley as well as Isabel, who I think is still here, for their time, effort and support. The journal really counts on it and is immensely grateful for it. I also want to thank the students on the editorial board for their uh, tireless efforts and commitment to the journal, which really does underpin uh, the success and quality of the publication. And finally, of course, a special thanks and congratulations to Veronica Sebevsky, the editor of Issue 41.3. Veronica's vision and intellectual leadership in conceiving of, preparing for, planning, uh, and after a year, executing this thematic issue of the journal has been phenomenal. Her positive energy, commitment, and care and concern for our team has been an asset to the journal, and it has been a true privilege to work with her over the year. She deserves to be very proud of what she has achieved. We're all very excited about the issue itself on vulnerability and the law, uh, responding to our, whoa, responding to our <laughs> online marketing via Twitter last week, uh, a professor of law from Melbourne Law School, who I hasten to add has no connection to the journal, <laughs> declared that, and I'm quoting now, the UNSW Law Journal themed editions are the best thing in university law publishing in Australia. <laughs> Full stop. <laughs> Full stop, which any good tweeter knows should be at the end of every tweet, and any good editor knows at the end of every foot footnote. <laughs> that is high and very welcome praise indeed, but when we consider that the law now and throughout much of its history has been an agent of discrimination uh, and, and oppression against those in our society who most depend on it for protection and support, we're reminded of the special obligation of lawyers to do what we can to address that imbalance and to, to view the law as an instrument and our role in it as an instrument for promoting fairness and justice. That is a reminder which Veronica and the authors in this issue have provoked us to contemplate deeply and honestly, and I'm delighted that you're all here to help us do so. 
So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Scott Farrell, partner here at Kinglewood Mallisons, to welcome us to the firm. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for coming to my place. Uh, before I start, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, my name is Scott Farrell, you just heard that. I'm a, a partner here, and as I was just said, I'm an ambassador um, for our Community Impact Program. Now, if you want to know what that is, Jane's here and she's just over there, so after all the presentations, you make sure you ask her lots of questions. I will get to deliver what I want to deliver, and then Jane has to explain everything after that. Um, KWM has had a long association with the Uni of New South Wales Law School. As we just heard, it's 37 years. Um, a lot of our summer clerks, a lot of our graduates, a lot of our partners, more than half of my team comes from that particular university. I'm extremely sad to say I myself don't. Um, and I apologise for that in advance. Um, and lumberers give lectures for that university. Um, and that makes it a particular pleasure to be able to host this event. As we said, we have this, um, we have our community impact program, and, and our community impact program has a new name, uh, and the new name reflects still the same commitment we had before to communities in which we live, work, and operate, um, but it has a renewed focus on what we're actually trying to achieve, um, a sustained long-term and significant impact for those in need, especially the vulnerable. Now, Veronica Sebesti's editorial to this edition shows just how complex some of the concepts are. In fact, that's kind of unfair, actually. I actually understood the concepts a whole lot better when I read Veronica's uh, <laughs> editorial. <laughs> um, um, but there's, a, there's a particular point that came out of that which resonated um, uh, with me, which is, um, one of the three points that Veronica makes is how does the law exacerbate vulnerability? Now, for those of you who are in the room who are lawyers, please keep that in mind. And if you are lawyers just starting your career, don't forget it. Uh, because it is an important and fundamental function um, that we as a profession have, is to always be on guard for that. As you become more and more successful, you may contribute to the creation of laws, always keep in mind that what you are doing is for everyone and not just for someone, particularly if it's just for the someone that happens to be paying you. That's what, in my view, a profession actually means. And importantly, um, in the actual forward, there's a paragraph that I want to, you're gonna have to bear with me here because it's my place, you're just gonna have to stay here while I read this one paragraph, which I think is really important and it, and it resonated with me um, particularly, and I'll explain why, and particularly in some of the work I do. A further important aspect of vulnerability theory is to reject the assumption that vulnerability is something to be avoided or overcome. Rather, vulnerability is to be greatly welcomed. Our mutual vulnerability requires us to reach out to others to offer and to receive help from them. The virtues of beneficence and compassion are encouraged and necessary. We have to become open to others and our own and others' needs. A recognition of our mutual vulnerability leads to empathy and understanding. It creates intimacy and trust. It compels us to focus on the interactive, cooperative solutions to the issues we address. Now, why did I particularly read that out? Because this is ever so more, ever, ever more so in this rapidly changing world. And we see this every day here. People can become vulnerable very, very quickly, just as some other people are surprised and delighted by the very things which are making others vulnerable. Care for the rights of the vulnerable is a critical role in our profession as lawyers, because what I just, what I just read out in relation to vulnerability was in part a description of what it means to be human. And as we deal with many things, and many of you in the room will deal with aspects of technology, and there'll be a legal interaction with that technology, it's great to remember there are humans involved. And humans are vulnerable. That's what makes them so beautiful to deal with. So vulnerability can be overlooked in a digital and data-driven age. Now, I'm by far the expert. The experts have contributed to this. Um, the perspective contained in this edition um, should should inform the way that certainly we uh, approach our pro bono programs, but also the practice of our 
profession and also those who we are privileged to assist. So thank you again for listening to me and being here this evening. I'll now hand over to Veronica Sebesti, who I must at last say has an absolutely charming and wonderful family who spent 10 minutes talking to me beforehand. <laughs> thank you very much, Veronica. Thank you very much, Scott. I too would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, uh, and extend that to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. And in making this acknowledgement, I also sincerely hope that positive steps are taken to fix the policies and issues that have resulted in the particular vulnerability of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in many contexts. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to welcome you all to the launch of Volume 41, Issue 3 of the UNSW Law Journal. Today we are celebrating the first fully thematic issue under our new publication structure, uh, which otherwise includes three issues of a generalist nature. The theme of this issue is, of course, vulnerability and the law. And there are several different ways to look at vulnerability. The first thing that might come into your mind could be particular circumstances of heightened vulnerability, such as childhood, or having a lack of knowledge about a particular area, or being marginalised in society. However, theorists in recent decades have challenged this idea of situation-specific vulnerability. Martha Feynman, one of the pioneers of this new approach, uh, suggests that vulnerability is something that is inherent, constant, uh, and shared by all as part of the human condition. She rejects the idea that an individual or a group can be considered more or less vulnerable than another, and instead focuses on how institutions can engender different levels of resilience and how inherent vulnerability can be revealed by different situations. So with this theoretical backdrop, I sought to, in this thematic issue, answer three different questions, one of which Scott alluded to before. And these are first, how exactly does the law define vulnerability? if at all. Second, how does and how should the law protect people, groups or institutions it's classified as vulnerable or less resilient, to use Feynman's terminology? And third, on the other hand, how does the law exacerbate vulnerability or reduce resilience? The 12 articles in this issue answer these questions in different ways. Some embrace Feynman's conception of universal vulnerability. Others direct their attention more towards examples of situational vulnerability, and others still question the utility of applying the vulnerability framework to particular areas of law in the first place. Shireen Morris looks at the constitutional vulnerability of Indigenous peoples as she explores the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Two articles examine vulnerability in relation to police, and that's Stephen Gray's article arguing for the repeal of law enforcement officers' immunity from criminal liability and Sinead O'Brien Butler's article, where she applies international human rights law to challenge the Victorian police complaints mechanism. Next, Fleur Beaupert's article examines how mental health law defines and produces vulnerability, and Terry Carney scrutinises the extent to which it is actually useful to look at Australian social security law through the lens of vulnerability. Considering people with disabilities, Yvette Maker and colleagues Consider the significance of obligations in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People's, oh, sorry, Persons with Disabilities for Consumer Protection Law and Policy. And Dominique Allen examines whether the Commonwealth Fair Work Act effectively addresses disability discrimination in the workplace. Continuing the examination of vulnerability in the workplace, Alexander Riley argues that the current requirements for the Safe Haven Enterprise visa um, place visa holders in a position of extreme vulnerability in the Australian, work sorry, in the Australian workforce, while, to uh, while Thomas Havala explores significant uncertainty regarding the use of personal leave by women undergoing IVF treatments. The intersection of the law with vulnerabilities that women face in our society continues to be explored by Tanya D'Souza and colleagues they argue that by failing to address gendered hate speech, Australian law permits the marginalisation of women and girls and actively exacerbates their vulnerability to exclusion and gender-based harm. Further, Helia Scola examines how the Australian legal response to forced marriage seeks to remedy the vulnerabilities of those in or at risk of a forced marriage. And finally, 
Emily MacDonald and Maria O'Sullivan analyse the fast-track assessment process for certain asylum seekers in Australia and the implications of this for procedural fairness. Before I hand over to our very, very distinguished speakers, who I will introduce again shortly, I must first take a few moments to thank the many people who have made this issue possible and also preserved my sanity over the past 13 months. <laughs> first and foremost, I would like to sincerely thank the authors of the articles and the foreword, some of whom are here tonight, um, for entrusting us with their work and for engaging with the theme in such interesting and thought-provoking ways. It has truly been a privilege and a pleasure to work with you. I would also like to thank the many anonymous peer reviewers for their time and expertise. This is both this is incredibly um, immensely valuable in providing the authors with feedback, but also enabling the student editors to make informed publication decisions. I'm also very grateful to our wonderful faculty advisors, Professor Rosalind Dixon and Professor Gary Edmonds, as well as our Dean, Professor George Williams, uh, for their continued support of the journal and all the editors. I also again thank King and Wood Mallison for hosting us tonight, as well as our two other premier sponsors, Hermit Smith Freehills and Alan's Linklaters. And of course, the journal would not be able to function without the very hard work of the student members of the editorial board, uh, who have given up their study time, sleep and weekends to edit the issue. It is thanks to their dedicated efforts that there is no out of place word in a quote, slightly misnumbered pinpoint reference or footnote, uh, sorry, footnote placed before a full stop rather than after. I'd especially like to acknowledge those who volunteered for extra edits or came out of retirement to help. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also very grateful to the board for their friendship and support over the past 13 months. And in particular, I'd like to thank my fellow members of the executive committee uh, for guiding me along the way, helping with the search for peer reviewers and post P2 processing, and also keeping me very well supplied with tea. <laughs> Amongst them, I'd like to also acknowledge, I think some of the unhung, I'm oh, sorry, unhung, unsung heroes, <laughs> yeah, may have long remained unhung, <laughs> of the journal. Our digital editor, Seyun, our executive editor, Lachlan, for the work that they do, and also Chris, our forum editor, for his support in more ways than I can name. I'll conclude my long list uh, with thanks to my ever patient and loving friends and family. Your support of all my various endeavours means so much to me and I'm eternally grateful. As apparently is a ship, or whatever that is. <laughs> so it is now with great pleasure that I welcome our two keynote speakers for the evening. Emeritus Professor Rosalind Croucher was appointed as President of the Australian Human Rights Commission in July 2017 after seven and a half years as president of the Australian, Australian Law Reform Commission. In 2014, she was acknowledged for her contributions to public policy as one of Australia's 100 Women of Influence and was awarded the Australian Women Lawyers Award. In the Australian Day Honours List in 2015, Professor Croucher was made a member of the Order of Australia. In 2016, Macquarie University conferred on her the title of Emeritus Professor and in 2018, UNSW conferred on her an honorary LLD. Interim Director of the Disability Innovation Institute, UNSW, and a human rights lawyer, Ms. Ro Ms. Rosemary, sorry, Ms. Rosemary Kays currently teaches in the Faculty of Law at UNSW, convening international law and human rights subjects, and focusing on the equality provisions within international instruments and their translation into domestic law and policy. She is also the chairperson of the Australian Centre for Disability Law and was also an external expert on the Australian Government delegation to the United Nations negotiations for the Convention on the, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And during the ad hoc committee, she facilitated the negotiations on Article 24, Education. In June 2018, she was, as Lachlan alluded to, elected to the United Nations Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability from 2019 2022. So without further ado, I would now like to welcome Professor Croucher first to speak, followed by Ms. Kays. Thank you, Veronica, for that delightful introduction. Um, I'll also add my acknowledgements to the traditional custodians, and I particularly like the acknowledgement of emerging leaders. Um, the future rests on the students of the UNSW Law Journal Editorial Committee, and also the emerging leaders of our First Peoples. Um, I was delighted to be invited to 
share the stage with Her Excellency. I think there's no other title that I should give you other than Your Excellency. Um, but Rosemary was also uh, a very valued member of the advisory committee um, for the Australian Law Reform Commission, as was Emeritus Professor Terry Carney, who graces the audience tonight, um, on the, the disability inquiry, a uh, very important one for us, and the ramifications of that are still rippling through the policy landscape. Can I also acknowledge Lachlan? Thank you, Lachlan, for your introduction. Um, the head of school, Professor Andrew Lynch, um, I, and Scott, Scott Farrell. Um, I was also going to acknowledge um, in um, the work of Daniel Creasy, the head of pro bono and community impact at Kingwood Mallisons for their ongoing support of the work of the Human Rights Commission. I've also had a very special relationship with the university. I undertook my own PhD there, although my undergraduate studies were at Sydney, but we'll forget about that. <laughs> um, I did my doctorate at New South Wales, and I was also, I spent seven very happy years, uh, and formative years for me, on the academic staff. And um, as you mentioned, um, the, I, I had the great honour to receive um, another, um, another doctoral acknowledgement by the university, although I must say I prefer the, the, the PhD gown. The, 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 the LLD gown has a bit of a clash in colours. <laughs> <coughs> but also 30 years ago I had one of the, the, the first serious academic pieces that I'm very proud of published in the University of New South Wales Law Journal. So I'm part of the, 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 the collection of um, authors over many, many years, although disappeared in the weight, the avalanche of, of brilliant writing ever since. I think um, Her Excellency and I are probably the midwives tonight in the, the launch of the journal. And um, it, it was, um, it's a great honour, <coughs> although it's a, it's a bit square um, to, to uh, be the midwife for it. Anyway, there, there's a stellar lineup on, uh, in the, um, of authors in this issue many of whom I know, but also the, the lovely thing about a blind refereeing process is you find all of these other people, new, emerging scholars, whose work you don't know already. And so that was, it was very special. Um, and, and the fact that the journal, like the Harvard Law, Law Review, is entirely a student product, it makes it a very special um, genre and special type of thing, and you're in fine company. Um, the hard copy journal arrived on Tuesday. The last page is numbered 1043, which was a bit alarming. <laughs> but I had been sent an electronic version where you tend not to notice such things, at least at first, especially when downloaded um, on an iPad into iBooks. So I've been given about 10 minutes, and if there were indeed 1,000 plus pages, this would mean 1.73 pages per second. But in fact, it's only 423 pages, which gives me 1.41 pages per second. But I think, um, Veronica, that you've given us a good walkthrough of the journal, so I will leave that to your excellent introduction. The subject of vulnerability has been close to my thinking for many years. My doctoral work took me into the law concerning limitations on testamentary freedom the right to leave property by will. I ambled far and wide over the centuries. Perhaps my supervisor might have um, exercised a firmer hand on me, but I had a lot of fun. And some of the key issues were ones of legal capacity. Married women, for example, were regarded as vulnerable. The denial to her of testamentary capacity and other rights in relation to property were regarded as for her protection and benefit, as William Blackstone wrote. Married women were denied testamentary power in relation to real property because it was regarded that they might be overborne by their husbands. The woman's capacity was denied rather than the husband's power checked. My work at the Australian Law Reform Commission on the Disability in Inquiry, amplified in the Elder Abuse Inquiry, saw me and the ALRC teams grappling with ideas of autonomy and safeguarding, the idea of supporting people in their decision-making, sensitive to their will and preferences. 
but I remembered my earlier work, which heightened my sensitivity to people being denied things because of an overprotective response. A classic example was how the Electoral Act contains provisions about disqualifying people of unsound mind from enrolling and voting. But it was really about the administrative inconvenience of fining people for not having voted. So, you deny the person the right to citizenship for administrative convenience? There may be reasons for forgiving the failure to vote, but deny them the right to be on the roll? It's a rhetorical question. We answered it in the way that you would expect. <laughs> One thing that struck me in um, quickly reviewing the articles in this issue of the journal is the substantial crossover between the content areas of those articles and the day-to-day -day work of the Australian Human Rights Commission. To pick a handful of examples to illustrate, firstly, in Shireen Morris's consideration of um, Indigenous issues, the work at the, the Human Rights Commission focuses strongly on the participation and representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Australian polity. This is an issue that successive social justice commissioners have focused on for many years. Indeed, all of them got together to make a joint submission to the Joint Select Committee on Constitutional Recognition. That is every social justice commissioner over 25 years. Another example from Terry Carney's article. The commission focuses regularly on the administration of social security law, including the movement to greater conditionality that, partic that protects, or particularly targets, I should say, vulnerable groups. Again, successive social justice commissioners have considered the human rights implications of welfare cards and schemes, such as the Community Development Program, on the human rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as a mechanism for managing vulnerability and disadvantaged, as opposed to overcoming it through community development initiatives. The protection of women against gendered hate speech. Uh, Tanya D'Souza and others article there. Um, this is an issue that is constantly raised with our Sex Discrimination Commissioner and on which she spoke before the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discri Discrimination Against Women in July this year. And just this month, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Kate Jenkins, has also released the results of the latest in the Commission's five yearly prevalence surveys on sexual harassment in the workplace. There has been a significant increase in the, the surveys over the years, in the self-reporting of sexual harassment across the board, as well as an increase in the number of people who say that when they witness such harassment, they are unsure of what to do. Those issues will be explored in more detail by the Commission in our current national inquiry into sexual harassment in Australian workplaces, which will take place over the next 12 months. Other articles about forced mental health interventions under civil mental health laws and consumer protection laws in the context of people with cognitive disabilities also raise important issues about the rights set out in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, especially relating to the truly difficult and contentious issue of substituted versus supported decision making and how to make this work in practice. From my work leading the disability inquiry and elder abuse inquiry, I know how theoretically and practically vexed these issues are. In the few minutes remaining, I thought I would look at the idea of vulnerability and to put, some, put forward some thoughts on this theme that is the common narrative between these diverse issues in the issue of the journal and how it connects to human rights. I was intrigued in the comments in the editorial and foreword about the concept of universal vulnerability, drawn particularly from the writing and thoughts of Martha Feynman. 
Some of this theoretical discussion, I have to say, is what I would describe as hard sums. Fascinating indeed and sophisticated, but where it really matters is in the world of the individual whose human rights are under challenge. The individual who is the principal subject of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, whose 70th birthday occurs in December this year. Veronica shared with us earlier the uh, definition of um, vulnerability in Feynman's writing. And in his foreword, Professor Jonathan Herring adds to this that if vulnerability is an, an inevitable aspect of the human condition, then it must cause us to question the weight that the law attaches to autonomy, self-sufficiency and individualised conceptions of human rights. Supporters of universal vulnerability claim that vulnerability is an inherent part of being human. I ha must say, I have a few competing reactions to this concept. The conception of vulnerability reminds me of the famous language of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 1 encapsulates that beneath our clothes, despite our geographic location or where we are born, we are all born free and equal in dignity and rights. Perhaps another way of framing that would be to say that we are all born equal in vulnerability. The opening words of each article of the Universal Declaration reiterate the universality of human rights. Everyone is entitled to. Everyone has the right to. No one shall be subject to torture. All are equal before the law, and so on. But in Article 29, the Declaration concludes with the corollary of this, that everyone is also responsible for human rights. Everyone has duties to the community in which alone the free and full development of his personality is possible. It reads, Is the concept of universal vulnerabil vulnerability, a bit of a tongue twister, is the concept of universal vulnerability a modern retelling of the promise to all humanity in Article 1 of the Universal Declaration? However, for me, there is a competing question or questions, namely how this conception of vulnerability accounts for issues such as systemic discrimination, historically derived marginalisation as experienced by our Indigenous peoples, cultural and racial bias that has been embedded in the mainstream cultures of many Western nations for people of ethnic and minority backgrounds, and the cultural biases experienced by people with disability about their capacity to be independent, make decisions and so forth, even to vote. Can the concept of universal vulnerability appropriately account for the contemporary experiences of Aboriginal people in the care and protection system? Can it be that resilience among Aboriginal people explains the disproportionate engagement with this system and the criminal justice system for the past 40 years? How do we relate it to historical antecedents such as the experience of the stolen generations? This was a deliberate process of separation of Indigenous children from their families where they were of mixed ethnic origin. Would it be appropriate to reframe the impact of these deliberate actions by the state as resulting in an impairment of the resilience of the stolen generations to respond to the universal vulnerability that we all share? Can we talk of universalism when the treatment experienced, in this case by our First Nations, is so different from that of everyone else? Frankly, this seems to give insufficient weight to the significant fact that none of the rest of us have ever faced this type of trauma. Building resilience is a critical element of theory around post-colonial healing processes, but it is but part of the picture. Which brings me back to the articles in the journal. Shireen Morris makes it explicit in her article that the ongoing problem faced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples is a structural exclusion from decision-making processes and a lack of meaningful participation, a right of rights, as she notes in her article. And Terry Carney's article on social security clients highlights a challenge for this concept of universal vulnerability, namely its misuse to justify even more intrusive conditional forms of welfare support that we have seen with cashless welfare cards, 
the attempt to use the safety net of welfare to control problematic behaviours. Often this is done without consent or engaged participation in the design phase and without addressing the broader social context in which those behaviours manifest. Even though its motivation may be broadly described as benevolent or in the language that people in the disability sectors would know well in their best interests. This year, I'm giving a series of speeches reflecting on the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in which I'm urging people to take a broader perspective when they think about human rights and their place in contemporary Australia. I think we have a long way to go to build a culture of what I describe as rights-mindedness in our community, as well as a stronger sense of civic duty from public servants about looking at policy and legal development through the lens of human rights. Our framework for protecting human rights in Australia is also rather messy. If I look at the legislation that guides the operation of the Australian Human Rights Commission, for example, it's riddled with holes and rabbit warrens, which intrigues me as a legal historian. There is a distinct lack of protection for some issues. There is inconsistency between the meaning of unlawful discrimination in the four discrimination laws and extremely complex differences in legal standards, which frankly can only be explained by the different point in time at which each piece of legislation was introduced. In other areas, such as complaints brought under the Human Rights Commission Act itself, including for discrimination in employment, there is an unsatisfactory process whereby complaints can be conciliated but if they are not resolved, then the complainant has no legal access to the courts. In legal terms, they are on a hiding to nothing. So where does that leave the Human Rights Commission in the court of public opinion? The analogy I would use is that the Commission is like a house that has had several rooms added over its 35 plus years, without any thought as to the impact on the overall design or architecture of the place. The architecture of the second iteration of the Commission in the 1986 legislation was framed around the Australian Bill of Rights Bill, which never got through the Senate. So the ICCPR is implemented in domestic law in a rather invisible way through complaints that can be made through the Human Rights Commission Act itself, but without any recourse to the courts. So there is much that can be done to improve the effectiveness of the domestic human rights architecture and to give us the chance to live up to the famous words of the Universal Declaration. Bringing it back to the theme of this edition of the journal, our current, our current human rights infrastructure does not include all the necessary tools in our kit bag to address vulnerability. So this year I'm doing my best to channel Eleanor Roosevelt, the chair of the United Nations Commission on Human Rights and the drafting committee of the Universal Declaration. A woman of similar vintage and of even more commanding stature, she was nearly six foot in old coinage and would have been welcome on any netball team. I only managed the most outstanding netball trophy in a particular year at my school and first prize in high jump, as I was a head taller than my peers at the time. And she also had a much better of command of French than I. But she worked a wonderful feat in herding the cats of the drafting committee to the adoption by the General Assembly on the 10th of December, 1948. As one of the midwives, I commend the journal to you the contributions within it are insightful. They will no doubt provoke deep thought and discussion about how we can go about the endeavour of ensuring the highest level of enjoyment of human rights for all people. Thank you. Thank you. It's um, always a really tough act to follow, Roz. <laughs> it's always really difficult being the uh, second speaker or in this case, the third or fourth speaker, because basically, Martha Feynman's been done to death, so I've got nothing to say. Let's all go have a drink. <laughs> no? Okay. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land in which we meet this evening, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. 
and I pay respects to their elders past and present and to Scott's very meaningful statement of the emerging leaders. The emerging leaders unfortunately will be taking on a lot. I'm concerned about what we're going to leave the emerging uh, populations in this country, but let's be optimistic. Tonight, I wanted to pick up on the topic of vulnerability in the sense that in my brief look through the articles that are included in the journal, it was obvious that there was so, so much synergy in the collective of the points of view that were expressed. And in recognising that synergy, <laughs> it reminded me of a discussion that a colleague, Belinda Smith, and I had in developing a book chapter for a book on um, charters of human rights in Australia. And I thought this evening what I would do is revisit the discussion that we had on universal vulnerability in that chapter. So basically you've got two for one this evening. The thoughts of both myself and Belinda Smith, who is a, a highly recognised and uh, respected discrimination lawyer who works at the University of Sydney. What I want to do is I want to examine vulnerability and universal vulnerability from the perspective of disability. To look through the concept of disability and vulnerability and to look at the way that it is socially constructed and what that means for the way the law deals with vulnerable people, but also to look at the interrelatedness of vulnerability across population groups. It's clear from the public discourse and policy that the established conceptualisation of disability reflects a de deficit approach, where disability is viewed as a problem an individualised issue where vulnerable individuals require care, treatment and protection within a social welfare regime as a way of dealing with their special needs. This has been a powerful and enduring influence on the social conceptualisation of disability throughout modern history. As such, disability is the problem sorry, disability, the problem is intrinsically linked to the individual impairment with little or no recognition of the role of the social environment in disabling persons with impairments. This approach to disability as an individual deficiency has fostered policy responses that have developed separate parallel systems sorry, separate parallel institutions and services in isolation of mainstream institutions, such as residential care facilities, special education, sheltered employment, and justice diversion measures. Now for all the care treatment and protection, if we look at the lived experience of disability today, it's not a very pretty picture. It's one in five Australians, which is two, and prevalence is two to three times greater within the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. 45% of people with disability live in or near poverty, and they are often dependent on income support. Australia is ranked 28 out of 29 countries in terms of employment for people with disability. People with disability are victims of violence, abuse and exploitation. Three times higher than the general population. Much higher and more sustained for women with disability. This violence and exploitation is less likely to be reported, investigated or prosecuted. 
there is significant overrepresentation of people with disability within the criminal justice system. They are three to nine times more likely to be part of the prison population. Women with disability are the fastest growing prisoner cohort in Australia. 89% of the young men in the Dugdale Juvenile Justice Centre were young men with cognitive disability. People with disability are isolated, segregated and vulnerable. In institutional and inappropriate care, in residential care settings with heightened and increased risks of violence and sexual abuse. This segregation has meant that people with disability have been excluded from key social institutions, which has isolated them and the issues that disability raises from mainstream public policy. Further, segregation in education has meant historically low levels of academic achievement which have kept people with disability out of key professions and public administration. As a result, people with disability have not been represented in public decision-making processes on law and policy. Disability has not been an area for academic concern in the areas of law, policy, public administration, planning and architecture which has led to limited understanding of the issues raised by disability. As such, people with disability are rarely viewed as normative citizens, but rather as a vulnerable special interest group. They are seen as the exception to the norm. Like norms of sexism and racism, there is a persistent and pervasive norm of ableism which idealises able-bodiedness. Dan Goodley, a British um, academic, elaborates the valued citizen of the 21st century as being cognitively, socially and emotionally able and competent, biologically and psychologically stable, genetically and hormonally sound, and ontologically responsible, hearing, mobile, seeing, walking, and normal, sane, autonomous, self-sufficient, self-governing, reasonable, law-abiding, and economically viable. Anyone know him? Because it is a him. <laughs> <laughs> it is a him. But I think we can substitute in there some other points. They haven't been colonised. They didn't, they arrived in Australia on an aeroplane with a passport. They are of the dominant culture. It isn't just disability that is constructed in this way. The normative citizen is a very narrow concept. Being a norm, ableism is generally internalised, often unstated and can appear natural, neutral, benign. Those who are seeking to address ableism can thus be cast as seeking special treatment or even advantage, rather than merely the removal of biases and revision of structures and supports so as to enable equality. There is another way of conceptualising disability, and that is of part of human diversity, or as one aspect of the human condition. In this conceptualisation, impairments are not exceptional or abnormal. Instead, instead impairment is an infinitely various but universal feature of the human condition. Jerome Bickenbach has stated that no human 
has, has a complete repertoire of abilities. Suitable for all permutations of the physical and social environment. We are all relatively limited in some way at some time. It is the characterization and treatment of particular permeations of the human condition as disabilities that constitutes someone as a person with a disability. It is the perception and labeling of traits that do not sit comfortably within dominant social arrangements, regardless of whether those traits would be irrelevant with different social arrangements that makes them matter. For example, if deaf is different, then hearing must be the norm. The law operates on the assumption that the norm need not be stated and responds as if the chosen differences and norm were somehow inevitable and dictated by objective facts rather than by a subjective ordering of priorities and expectations. This conceptualisation draws on contemporary approaches to disability, such as the social model and ableism. The social model of disability locates the experience of disability in the social environment rather than the impairment. For example, the wheelchair user, for a wheelchair user, stairs are the disabling factor, not the impairment. Similarly, a narrow, narrowly conformist behavioural code for a classroom may be disabling for someone with autism because it does not acknowledge and allow for different modes and methods of learning. The theory of ableism provides a lens to illuminate and challenge the unstated characteristics of the normative citizen that underpins law and public policy. The fundamental tenet of this conceptualisation is universalism, that of modification of the ableist social norm to reflect human diversity. Disability as human diversity challenges this essentialism of the ableist foundations of modern society. This conceptualisation resonates with Feynman's vulnerable subject thesis, where she argues that the vulnerable subject must replace the autonomous and independent subject asserted in the liberal tradition. Far more representative of actual lived experience and the human condition, the vulnerable subject should be at the centre of our political and theoretical endeavours. She contends that understanding the significance, universality and constancy of vulnerability mandates that politics, ethics and law be fashioned around and complete comprehensive vision of the human, human experience if they are to meet the needs of real life subjects. Vulnerability is identified as a far more universal axiom than the autonomous rationality of liberal thought, concluding that the vulnerable subject approach does, not, does what the one-dimensional liberal subject approach cannot. It embodies the fact that human reality encompasses a wide range of differing and interdependent abilities over the span of a lifetime. This universal approach recognises that we are all vulnerable and independent. It is not about specific discrete groups. It is about society's ability to meet the needs of all. Vulnerability is not solely related to identified personal characteristics, but is far more contextual. This is a more inclusive notion and highlights the limitations of equality based on formal equality. 
identity groups. Sorry. This is particularly evident in the structure, operation and limitation of anti-discrimination laws, which are based on attributes reflecting identity groups. Formal equality based on identity groups ignores the fact that there are individuals who are relatively privileged, notwithstanding their membership of these groups, and that the goal of confronting discrimination against certain groups has largely eclipsed, even become a substitute for, the goal of eliminating material, social and political inequalities that exist across groups. This conceptualisation of disability also reflects a substantive understanding of equality. Formal equality merely requires the consistent application of law and policy and focuses on the elimination of inconsistency, stereotyping and prejudice of identity groups. It does not necessarily seek to change the fundamental structure of the norm because it assumes the existing norm is benign. In contrast, substantive equality is focused on the different impact of law and policy in social contexts, recognising the patterns of disadvantage and discrimination exist and result in different outcomes. The goal is to achieve equal outcomes for participation in society by everyone, regardless of personal characteristics or identity group membership. Sandra Fredman, a legal academic from South Africa, talks about four dimensions of social equality. This extends to redistribution to address economic and social disadvantage recognition that addresses economic recognition that addresses stigma stereotyping humiliation and violence participation that requires the genuine inclusion of the views and experience of all disabled pe disadvantaged people i get so used to saying disabled <laughs> disadvantaged people in political and other decision making and transformation supporting normative reform. It is this challenge that we have and I think Ros's claim that human rights can help us with this if we get back to the basics of human dignity and equal human worth. Thank you. Uh, well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's Andrew Lynch, and I'm the Head of School and Deputy Dean at UNSW Law. I also would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and paying my respects to their elders, past and present, and yes, also to acknowledge the emerging leaders. Uh, I also begin by giving the apologies of the Dean, Professor George Williams, who would love to have been here, but who is unable to join us tonight. Um, my role is uh, a very brief one, you'll be glad to hear, and uh, it's a really pleasurable one. I get to give a vote of thanks. Uh, and uh, whenever I do this at the Journal, I can't really stop. I don't want to limit myself to thanking the speakers. I'm going to thank pretty much everybody. Uh, but I promise I'll do so fairly succinctly. Uh, but first and foremost, uh, my key responsibility is to thank both uh, Ros Croucher and Rosemary Caius uh, for their very generous comments and reflections upon the ideas and themes of this uh, important issue of the journal, I'm sure you would all agree that um, what the, the role of, of midwives of an issue isn't simply to, to launch it in a formal sense, but really to whet the appetite of the readers. And uh, when you collect your copy of the journal, if you haven't already, and they're just at the back of the room, uh, I'm confident now that you are all eager to open the pages and to delve right in. Um, both Ros and Rosemary were uniquely placed, I think, to stress for us 
the very um, contemporary importance and relevance of this issue and the articles contained within it. So we've been the great beneficiaries of their perspectives based on many years of expertise and work experience in their fields of human rights and disability. And they've really, I think, opened up for us this notion of vulnerability as a concept through which we can appreciate the collected academic work in this journal. So I thank them very much for doing so. Uh, the second uh, uh, people I would like to thank are obviously Kingswood Mallison, and uh, in a number of senses, uh, obviously for their very long running support of the UNSW Law Journal, which uh, Lachlan mentioned earlier and which is I know appreciated by uh, the current and past editors uh, of the journal and future editors too, I, um, I hope and I'm confident to say, but also for hosting this event tonight. It's really wonderful to be in your place. Uh, we're very glad to be here. Um, uh, so thank you to Scott and Jane for that. And more broadly, Kingswood Mallison is a great friend of the UNSW Law Faculty and supports our research endeavours uh, and um, uh, supports many of our lead researchers as well. So we really value the relationship with the firm uh, and of which uh, the connection to the journal is probably the longest standing uh, and one that we definitely prize. Uh, then I would like to thank uh, the journal itself. And obviously, uh, Veronica is the woman of the night and I offer my congratulations to her for this amazing issue. I was thinking really it's incredible that uh, an issue on vulnerability hasn't been set, uh, taken already, that it was, it was waiting for the picking. Um, all law students know of the purple banner that hangs in the foyer of the law faculty with the words of our founding dean, Hal Wooten, who talks about the concerns of a law school should be upon those on whom the law bears harshly. Uh, and that is a tradition, that is an idea that is at the heart of the law school's genesis and one that we still take enormously seriously today through the work of individual academics, research centres such as the Cowdor Refugee Centre, the Australian Human Rights Institute and others. And also the work of uh, Ros Dixon and Richard Holden who have led a grand challenge at UNSW this year uh, on inequality. So uh, I, uh, I'm glad that vulnerability has made it as a thematic issue of the journal. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that it hadn't been done before, but it's entirely fitting that it is in, in, um, in this year's collection. Um, I also want to acknowledge and congratulate though and thank Isabel, Rose and Amelia, plus also Lachlan, Sayun and Chris for their leadership and work on the journal this year across their respective issues and responsibilities. Uh, the faculty is enormously proud of the journal and the work that the students uh, all do and contribute towards it. And I acknowledge all those who work uh, as part of the editorial team. It's a, it's a vast army. Uh, I always really like speaking at this event because uh, previous members of the journal's uh, workforce often attend. It has this sort of special alumni quality to it. Uh, and really to work on the UNSW Law Journal is to contribute to something really significant and major. It's an unforgettable experience. There seems to be a bond amongst those who have done so and it's always great to see them. So I hope that this year's editors will keep coming in the years ahead. Um, I also want to acknowledge my colleagues Ros Dixon and Gary Edmund, and Gary is here tonight, for the role that they play really in uh, acting as a link between the faculty and the journal and assisting its editors uh, throughout um, their preparation of the issues uh, in each year. Um, I have nothing further to say except, I think, to call upon you again to join with me in uh, audibly bringing hands together for thanking Roz and Rosemary. Thank you, Andrew. Well, that uh, concludes the formal part of this evening. Thank you all for coming. I agree with Andrew. It is great to see so many journal alumni here. They do like to come and touch base. They also like canapes. Um, and thank you also to Andrew for giving the game away about the slightly more secret location of the print copies of the journal. They're hiding up the back so that I can, for once, draw your attention to existing copies of the journal instead of, as has happened twice already this year, pointing at an empty table at the back of the room. <laughs> Nevertheless, about half a dozen of you managed to ask me where they were in the five minutes before we started. But please do take one and, uh, and enjoy reading it. Thanks again to Kingwood Mallisons. Please remain uh, and 
enjoy some more food and drink and good conversation and we'll hope to see you at the next launch.